I'm out here. I'm in Chicago now. It sounds like a, maybe a walk along Lake Michigan sort of day tomorrow. Well, you know, if you're in Chicago, it sounds like an Olympia Fields day ah, to me. Ah, you. you caught Who's me. Who's kidding who? You caught me out. <laughs> Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, did the Viking GM shade Kirk Cousins? Does college football need someone to step in? And why is Bill Belichick so effusive about Mac Jones? But we begin today with a report by the Athletics' Jim Bowden on CBS Sports that the Mets have contacted the Angels about the availability of Shohei Otani. Otani hit a home run last night against Kansas City, his 21st of the season. The Angels have said they have no interest in trading Otani. Will Bond, should they? No. No, 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 no. No. I know they don't win anything. They don't get to the playoffs even. They seem like they're wasting the careers of Drought. Yeah, that's right. And now Drought yeah, and, and Otani. Otani. Yeah. But I mean, that's right. So in baseball, the way to get better is to first get rid of all the assets you have and the people that folks would actually pay real money to see. Let's get rid of them and go backward. So, so how does that work? I mean, you know, the, the Angels need to go out and not have minimum wage players everywhere else except for the stars, and I'm including Anthony Rendon, who your Nationals lost to the Angels a couple right. of years ago. No, you got those three right. guys. I, I know a big three in baseball is not the same as a big three in the NBA, no. but it's a place no. to start. You've got those guys. Yeah. Tony, this guy, it, it, look, there, there have been these loose comparisons to Babe Ruth. The comparison to Babe Ruth would be how stupid was it when the Boston Red Sox got rid of Ruth? That was pretty yeah. stupid. It was all world, all time on the short list of American stupid decisions made. Don't get rid of Otani, no. So I'm not going to disagree with anything you've said. The Angels stink. Going into today, they were 4-15 and 15 in the month of July. And they have maybe the two best players in baseball. And they maybe have two all-timers in Trout and Otani, and they stink. All right, so we're going to get off that for a second. Something, in terms of this question, something very serendipitous happened to me today. I had, by chance, Jeff Passan on my podcast this morning. And we were talking about Otani and the possibility that Otani might go somewhere else. And we were talking in terms of the backdrop of Juan Soto, who may well go somewhere else. And we were talking about that Juan Soto might be the first $500 million player, or at least he might get between 40 and $45 million a year. And Passon said that the comparable players this year to Otani in the majors are Max Scherzer as a pitcher and Matt Olson as a hitter. I listened for a second, and he said, I'm going to go through the bell on this. He said, if you combine their salaries, that's $64 million. Is Otani worth $64 million to a team per year? And I was dumbfounded at first, but then I came around. Because, Mike, he plays two positions on an yes. all-star level. Yes. And he saves you a roster spot. So when everybody talks about how much money somebody else could make, if Otani was on the open He's market, the he would guy. set the record. Yes, because, he like, should. It, a, a lot of, the NBA likes to talk about players that are unicorns. Hey, Kristaps Porzingis is not a unicorn. This guy is. <laughs> this is guy's a unicorn. a unicorn. Yeah. He is. Keep him. Get better elsewhere. Oh, Stop yeah. being oh, sure. lazy, please. Let's move to the National Football League, where new Vikings general manager, Kwesi Adolfo Mensa admits to some concerns about his quarterback position. Minnesota has a new head coach, a new offensive system, same old quarterback, though, and Adolfo Mensa tells USA Today, quote, I'll be frank, the one asset where you get nervous about not burning it down is quarterback, close quote. Adolfo Mensa says he believes Kirk Cousins is a good quarterback, but, quote, we don't have Tom Brady, close quote. Tone, ouch. How should Cousins feel about what his GM just said? Okay, how should he feel? He should feel rich. He should feel as rich as he has every day for the last four or five years since he left Washington for the highest guaranteed contract in the history of the NFL. So he should feel rich. He also should recognize the reality of what this GM is saying. I mean, let's, let's understand that having a great quarterback is the most important thing in football. There's, there's no question about that. And let's look at quarterbacks who've won the Super Bowl lately. So there's Tom Brady, right, and there's Patrick Mahomes and Matthew Stafford. Would you take Kirk Cousins over any one of them? No, emphatically but no. But you could take it with, with Flacco. 
And you can take, well, I mean, that, come I'm on now. Get to that. This, okay. I'm going to get I'm going to get to that. All right. Quarterbacks who've lost the Super, back, Super Bowl lately, Jimmy Garoppolo, Jared Goff, that's the line. They're pretty good quarterbacks, not great. That's the line that he's on. Can he win one? Joe Flacco won one. Nick Foles won one. A few years back, Trent Dilfer won one. Yes, he can win one. Is he a great quarterback? No. How would I feel about this? I love what this guy said because we were sports writers, Mike. He's a great talker. I want to talk to a great talker. But if I was a player, I might feel wounded. If I was Cousins, I'd say, my guy just said I was good. Eh, I was eh. Well, I wasn't very good. I expect more from my GM. Well, saying he's not Tom Brady is like saying he's not Michael Jordan. I mean, you know, there's sort of a statement okay. of the obvious there. And you, I mean, sorry, the GM doesn't owe it to you to say you're, you're, you're right there shoulder to shoulder with the GOAT when you're not with the GOAT. So, yes, but right. hurt feelings are, uh, no question, Tone, they're inevitable. Um, he might have had a little bit too much truth-telling in his profession where nobody tells the yeah. truth. All they do is That's hype right. people day after day, right. month after month, season after season. Right. But I don't believe in his theory, Tone. You can win, you can get to the quarterback, and you can win the Super Bowl with those others that you mentioned. You can. You don't have to have a great quarterback, and that's yeah. the point of those other guys you. you mentioned. It helps you having a quarterback who can carry you through three or four playoff games in it a row. Helps. But you can win. Mike, this is the second day in a row that a big-time quarterback got publicly humiliated. Second day in a row. Kyler Murray and Kirk Cousins. Yes, yeah. That's yeah odd. That's let's, right. stick, let's stick with people named Kirk for 600. Kirk Ferentz, the football coach at Iowa, is the longest-tenured coach in the country. This is his 24th year at the same spot. Ferentz looks at college football now with a name, image, and likeness explosion and the acquisitive expansion of conferences like your Big Ten and the SEC, and he sees trouble. Ferentz said, and I'm quoting here, I think we're in a really precarious place. There's just a lot of vagueness, a lot of uncertainty. We need some intervention, unquote. Wilbon, is Ferentz right? Does college football need an intervention? Oh, hell yeah. And he wasn't the only one saying this at the Big Ten Media Comp Day yesterday. My coach, Pat Fitzgerald, used the word chaos. And those guys are 100% right. And Ferentz is a really smart, perceptive guy. Tony, I'm going to give you the doomsday scenario. You, you, you know I'm unabashed. I'm a shameless college football, not just a fan, but a, but a, but a, but a booster. I mean, I, let's call it what I am. You know, I'm a season ticket geek. I go, I follow. I'm going to Ireland in a month to see a college football game. My Wildcats play Nebraska. Tony, I think that college football, and maybe college basketball too, but certainly college football, I think it's going the way of boxing and horse racing. And we had Theo Epstein on yesterday telling us sp Brilliant. specifically Brilliant. how he's trying to fix baseball, which needs fixing. I mean, Theo's right on the money on everything he said. And so I think college football is going the way of that stuff, Tone. I think that there are always going to be great games and big stars and stuff like that. But I think, I think the product will be lesser over time. And I think we may be seeing the beginning of the end now because there's no control. There needs to be a commissioner, and nobody's going to agree on that either. This is really interesting to me, the position that you take. I understand exactly what Ference is saying because like you and like him, I am very old. Okay, and I got used to watching college football over the last 50 years, and I knew what it was. And now there are no rules anymore. There's None. just no rules. And the NCAA is a paper lion. Doesn't mean yep. anything. Nobody cares about it. Chaos is a fair word for me. You know, I, I, nobody knows exactly what's going on. But our, when you talk about an intervention, who exactly is going to intervene? Is it going to be coaches, rich coaches, no. who don't want any change no. at all? Is no. it going to be young coaches like Lane Kiffin that propose a salary cap? Because no. what's happening here, Mike, plain and simple, what is happening here is that old coaches don't want any change. They don't want any of this at all. They're losing control to the players. Lost. And the players have never had Lost. money and they've never had control and they've never had yeah. any influence. So it's a struggle right now. It's, is it crazy? Yes. But it's, to me, it's wildly exciting. And I'll just be brief and say this. This happened in basketball. The, the, the people that are going to do well, Mike, are the coaches that adjust to this reality more quickly than the others. 
John Calipari did this with one and dones in Kentucky and forced Mike Krzyzewski, who's an establishment coach, to do it at Duke. Five years from now, I don't share your doomsday situation. I think it will all be okay, but I this worry. is Darwinian right now to I me. Worry, it's Tom. Dar- well, cause, I worry, I got a nomination. I got a nomination. understand. You and I Go ahead. could, you know, in our spare time, even though we spend so much time doing this, we could be co-commissioners of college football. I just threw our names in, the, in, you know, in a hat. How about that? That's you good. and me. Good job huh? out of you. Yeah, we could yeah, use the money, couldn't so. we? Let's yeah. take a break. But coming up, what's up with Bill Belichick's praise for Mac Jones? And what's the word for Carl? Exchange words with Will Bond. What's first? Bill Belichick sounds blank about Mac Jones. My word is bewitched. The other day, Bill Belichick was talking about his second-year quarterback, Mac Jones, and he said he had made dramatic improvement and tremendous strides. Belichick wasn't even asked about this. He just volunteered it. This is Bill Belichick, who never says a nice word about anybody, particularly an offensive player, and it sounds like he wants to build a statue to this kid. Here are the words again, Mike. Dramatic improvement, tremendous strides. He had Tom Brady for 20 years. He never said anything like that. He referred to Brady most of the time as the quarterback. So if I'm Mac Jones, I'm a little bit concerned because everything Belichick does is calculated. What's the calculation here? Are you trying to pump the kid up or put a target on him? Tone, that's just it. It isn't calculated. I mean, it's this is how he feels. It's un Belichickian. It is. It's out of care. I mean, it's just not in character with what he does. First of all, as you said accurately, he was not asked. He just started praising him. But this just should look for Bill Belichick. You know the phrase that we used to utter as young writers? Consider the source for when we were reporting something. I think of Bill Belichick and Greg Popovich as coaches that when I was standing there with a notebook and they said something, whether it was positive or negative about somebody, when they said it, you took it to the bank. So this is this is so unlike Belichick that now we go into this season thinking about Mac Jones. Oh, my God, what's he going to look like? He was the best by far of the rookie quarterbacks last year, and now – Belichick is saying, wait till you see what we got next. I can't wait. We'll he's not the master we'll of hype. It's un but I'm excited no, to see not him. That. What's next? Carlos Rodon's bat kick was blank. I got more than one word. I got nearly disastrous. Rodon was the starting pitcher for the Giants last night. I guess he had a couple innings he didn't like. He comes back to the dugout. He kicks a bat. But the bat hits off the shortstop's knee. Tyro Estrada. This is a potential DL situation. This is potentially terrible. And and luckily, Estrada wasn't hurt. Rodon went over there and couldn't apologize quickly enough and couldn't apologize fully enough. And after the game, he called it an unacceptable action. I hit my teammate, probably the nicest teammate on the team, just a selfish selfish action. It cannot happen. It's stupid. What's interesting to me is Rodon is one of these guys, a big-name good player, who, whose name is out there on the trade deadline, if the Giants, not having a good season, become sellers and not buyers. And I wonder, Mike, will this have any effect on what they do with Rodon? Tony, I, I wouldn't think so. Look, it was little league-ish. Rodon's back kick was little league-ish. This is the kind of thing we all did when we were a 10, 11, and 12 years old. I know I did it way too often and probably had it done to me a couple of times. He also swung his glove around and nearly hit his pitching coach in the head in the moment before the back kick. So his temper, he's got to get control of it. It sounds like this is not a limited episode. This is is his move and his manager, and he referred to it by saying, I I, got to be better than this. So be better, starting now. Get out of Little League and be an adult. And yes, he may get traded, and I'd still trade for him despite the back kick. That's the last word. Let's take one last break, but still to come will the Mets sweep the two-game Subway Series against the Yankees. Oh, God, I-95 talk. Jason Tatum answers a question about the Celtics possibly trading for Kevin Durant. That's even more I-95 talk. That's four I-95 locations right there in that team. Costas did the game last night. He was great. He's always great. It's Costas. He was great. He was great. 
It really was. Tonight on Sports Center at 6 Eastern, how the Browns are navigating camp with their uncertain QB situation. Plus, Julio Jones sounds off on joining forces with Tom Brady and the moves the Yankees and Mets should make before the MLB trade deadline. Quarterback in Tennessee has been marked by great promise and not quite enough delivery. After spending six years in Miami, Tannehill came to Tennessee in 2019, and his numbers there are very good. He has 76 touchdowns and 23 interceptions. He's completing 67.3% of his passes. He's 30 and 13 as the starter. The Titans have made the playoffs in each of his three seasons there. But after getting to the AFC Championship game in 2019, the Titans have been knocked out in their first playoff game the last two years. Last year, Tennessee was the number one seed in the AFC, and they went out at home to Cincinnati in a game where Tannehill had one touchdown pass and three interceptions. Tannehill was the third quarterback taken in the 2012 draft at number eight. The first two, Andrew Luck and Robert Griffin, are out of the league. Tony Tannehill, he, he does need one terrific playoff game to get back to that sort of AFC championship game point. I think there, I wouldn't give up on Tannehill and that Tennessee team just yet. I mean, they had a couple of tough games, but the playoffs are difficult. They're going to have to break through. I think they can this season. Okay, we'll see if they do. We're not so happy anniversary, Tony Kukoc. On this day, 30 years ago in Barcelona, the young oh. Croatian star got undressed by the Dream Team in the first round of the Olympics. Croatia lost 103 to 70, and Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen suffocated Kukoc into just four points on two of 11 shooting and harassed him into seven turnovers. These efforts were widely interpreted as a slap at Bulls general manager Jerry Krause for drafting Kukoc and highly praising him. Kukoc would later join Jordan and Pippen for three NBA championships in Chicago. And at his Hall of Fame induction in 2021, Kukoc thanked Jordan and Pippen for, quote, kicking my butt during the Olympics in Barcelona and motivating me even harder to become an important part of the Chicago Bulls, unquote. Well, when I was in Barcelona, I did not go to this game. Were you at this one? Oh, I went to that game, Tony. You're right. It was a slap at Jerry Krause, not at Tony Kukoc, because Krause followed Kukoc around the world to scout him, and he acted like Kukoc was going to take the place of Jordan and Pippen, which, of course, was crazy. Let me just say this, because I know a little bit about the relationship. They love Tony Kukoc, and Tony Kukoc loves them right now, to this day. Absolutely. That's good to know. That really is. I like Kukoc. Always thought it was a good player. Love him. Continuing happy trails to David Bakhtiari. The Packers have said their all-pro left tackle underwent another knee procedure during this offseason. That would be his third known knee surgery since Bakhtiari tore his ACL on December 31st, 2020. Bakhtiari played only 27 snaps last season, all in the regular season finale at Detroit. Bakhtiari did not practice at OTAs or minicamp earlier this year, and it remains unclear whether he will be available for the season opener. Packers GM Brian Gutekunst described himself as, quote, cautiously optimistic, unquote, and said he expects Bakhtiari to return to his all-pro level. But if Bakhtiari isn't ready for the opener, the Packers could be without their two best offensive linemen, as Elton Jenkins is also attempting to come back from an ACL tear. And remember, Devontae Adams left for Las Vegas, so best of luck, Aaron Rodgers. Tom, don't have the sky falling. If those guys are out there, they'll be fine. If they're not, their subs will be fine. It's a superior franchise to the others in the division, the Vikings, the Lions, the Bears. Superior, they'll have no issues. So you don't worry about Rodgers at all, not being no, protected or not, not having a quick receiver? Not, not even that much. Let's go to the big finish. Celtic star Jason Tatum says he admires Kevin Durant, but he loves the team he's got. Your thoughts? Good for Jason Tatum. He should love his team. They just went to the finals and he swept Kevin Durant. Come on. Colts All-Pro linebacker Darius Leonard tells reporters he'd like to be called by his middle name, Shaquille, going forward. Does this make sense? Well, apparently his whole family had called him Shaquille and he was only called Darius when he was in trouble. I might go to my middle name. You can call me Irwin from now on. Irwin, See how that works. Yeah. The Thunder. I like that. The Thunder hired shooting expert Chip England. As an assistant coach, is that significant? He's been with the Spurs a long time. He's had great success with a lot of shooters in the league. It makes sense to hire him. Yes. Blue Jays beat the Cardinals for Toronto's seventh straight win. Is that a big deal? The Blue Jays spent a lot of money in the offseason. A lot of people thought that they would win that division. It's the best division in all the sports. But, yes, it's a big deal. Last one. 
The Mets beat the Yankees last night and send birthday boy Max Scherzer to the mound tonight. Are you smelling sweet? It's a two-game series. Look, I don't care about Mets Yankees. I'm sure you do. I care about Astros Yankees. Astros Yankees. That's what I care about. Are you about, smelling Tom? sweet? It's just smelling sweet. That's all we yeah, have. Yeah, your warrior god is probably going to win. We'll try to do better the next time, and I'm Erwin Kornheiser. <laughs> I'm Ray Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, <laughs> Knuckleheads. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN.